This lesson is on the second derivative in graphs. Before you do this lesson, you should have already done the lesson concerning the first derivative and how you use that first derivative to determine where a function is increasing or decreasing and how you find critical values. What I want to do, first of all, is to look at just kind of a random sketch of a graph and talk to you a little bit about the shape of a graph. Let's say we have an xy axis here. I can have a curve that is increasing up like that. Okay, Then maybe it will change and decrease a while. Okay, Increase and decrease. What I want to talk about is notice on this interval as I'm going up how my curve is going up like this. Okay. Along here, the curve is going up in much the same way. But notice right about here, my curve is still going up, but it's starting to fold over like this. In other words, as a curve increases, it can increase like this, shaped like this, or it can increase like this. See the difference? This looks like it would hold water if you put water in it. This looks like if you put water on it, it would fall off. Going up, both of them are increasing. Similarly, when you decrease, you can decrease down like this, like it is right in here. But notice right in this area, we're still decreasing, but we're curved more up like this. So as we increase, we would like to know, are we increasing like this, or are we increasing like this? As we decrease, are we decreasing like this, or are we decreasing like this? That's what we can learn from our second derivative. Now. I have here the graph of a first of a function and its first derivative. Now you may have to look close at this because I wanted you to be sure to tell the difference. My function is f of x equals negative one third x cubed plus x squared. And that's the graph that you see in the dark. That's f right here. Notice how it's decreasing, curving like this. Okay? Right in here, it starts increasing, curving up like this, and then it sort of changes. It's still increasing, but it's curving over more this direction. Then when it decreases, it's curving down this way instead of like it was here. The first derivative of this function is negative x squared plus 2x. That graph is this parabola that you can just kind of barely see on your screen here. But what I want you to notice is when the curve is like this, whether it's increasing or decreasing, it's kind of cupping up like this, that corresponds to this part of the graph of my first derivative. Notice on that part, the first derivative is an increasing function. So when the first derivative is increasing, my original function is cupping up like this. Notice when the curve is cupping downward like that, this part of the graph is where my first derivative is coming down. It's decreasing. Now, in your first lesson, you learned that the derivative of a function tells you where it's increasing and decreasing. So for this graph, the derivative of this graph would tell me where it's going up and where it's coming down. Well, the derivative of this would be the derivative of the first derivative. In other words, the second derivative. Notice the second derivative of this function would be negative 2x plus 2. If I factor that, notice my critical value is x equal 1. From negative infinity to 1, from 1 to infinity. If I pick a test number here like 0, that's negative times negative is a positive. If I pick a number here, that's going to be a positive times a negative is negative. My first derivative is increasing. Notice this is the derivative of my derivative. So I'm increasing here, decreasing here. Increasing, decreasing. When my first derivative is increasing, my curve is cupped upward. When my first derivative is decreasing, my curve is cupped downward. Now, obviously, the derivative of the first derivative is the same thing as the second derivative. So that's where we're going with this. The second derivative, if it's positive, tells us our curve is cupping upward like this. If our second derivative is negative, 
we're cupping downward. We refer to the way that that sort of cupping is, I've been referring to it as concavity. Here's a definition of concave up. A graph is concave upward if the curve lies above its tangent lines. The slopes of the tangent lines are increasing. Therefore, the first derivative is increasing, which means its derivative, the second derivative, would be positive. Let me show you on a little sketch here what we mean about these tangent lines. If you have a curve that's sort of cupping upward like this, which we call concave up, notice any point that you choose along here if you sketch in the tangent line the tangent line would be below the curve. In other words, the curve is above the tangent lines. So if the curve is above the tangent lines, it's cupping upward like this, we call that concave up. Notice the slopes of these tangent lines. This would be a pretty steep negative value, like say negative three. This might level off a little, negative two. Maybe that's a slope of negative one. Maybe I hit a, a slope of zero. Notice over here, my slopes become positive, like one, two. But notice as I go, these numbers are increasing. The slopes of the tangent lines are increasing. Okay, And of course the second derivative tells us where the first derivative is increasing. Okay, Now, let's look at our definition of concave down. A graph is concave downward if the curve lies below its tangent lines. The slopes of the tangent lines are decreasing, therefore the first derivative is decreasing, which means the second derivative is negative. Again, let's look at this. If our curve is cur cupping over like that, notice again if you pick points and you do tangent lines, where are the tangent lines? They're above the curve, aren't they? The curve is below the tangent lines. Okay. Let's talk about these slopes. That might be like a slope of 3, 2, we might go through a slope of 0. Then notice they become negative, but these slopes are decreasing, okay? So our first derivative would be decreasing. Slopes are decreasing, that's the first derivative, which means the second derivative is negative. The second derivative is telling us where the first derivative is increasing or decreasing. So let's see if we can kind of put this together. Steps for determining concavity. Determine where the second derivative is zero, where the second derivative is undefined, and where f is discontinuous. Now this is important. Second derivative, either zero or undefined, the original function discontinuous. Use these values to set up test intervals. Test the sign of f double prime in each test interval. You'll notice this setup is very much like the setup we have with our first derivative. That's why sometimes students get confused. So we're going to hopefully, as we go through this lesson, keep everything straight for you so you'll know what's going on here. Now, I have another definition for you here, a point of inflection. If a continuous function changes from concave up to concave down or vice versa at a point where there's a tangent line, that point is called an inflection. In other words, if you've got a curve that's concave up, let's say, and then it changes and starts being concave down. See, it's concave up here, concave down here. Right along in here, we're changing from concave up to concave down. Now, as it turns out, there is a tangent line here. It's a vertical one, okay? But as long as our curve is continuous and we've got a tangent line, that will be a point of inflection. Now, we have an important rule. For the function f, if c, f of c is a point of inflection, then either the second derivative at c is 0, or the second derivative is undefined there. In other words, points of inflections will occur where either the second derivative is zero or undefined. I want to remind you that much like the idea of uh, some of those uh, 
relative minimums and maximums. Just because your second derivative is zero does not mean you, that you have an inflection. It might not be one. But if there is an inflection, that second derivative must either be zero or undefined. So again, that narrows down the possibilities of where those inflections would be. Okay, let's notice our instructions here. Determine the intervals where the graph of the function is concave up or down. Now, this is real important. Your first derivative is used to tell you where the original function is increasing or decreasing. The second derivative tells us whether the curve is concave up or down. So, in other words, it's giving us a shape idea, whereas the first derivative is telling us whether we're going up or down. So, since we want to know where we're concave up or down, we're going to go to the second derivative. Of course, to get there, we have to go through the first derivative first. So, let's get the first derivative. We'd have, what, 4x cubed minus 12x squared, and of course, plus 0. Now, our second derivative, let's see, would be 12x squared minus 24x. Now, our steps said, let's see if I can find that again for you right quick, determine where the second derivative is equal 0, where the second derivative is undefined, and where the original function is discontinuous. Okay, well the original function is continuous everywhere because it's a polynomial, so we don't have to worry about that. The second derivative is defined everywhere, so we don't have any points there. So all we have to worry about is where is this second derivative equal zero. Let's do a little factoring over here. We can factor out a 12x, leaves x minus 2. So let's see, that gives me x equals 0 from this factor. And if we set x minus 2 equals 0, we're going to get what? x equal 2. Okay? So we're going to use these numbers to set up test intervals. So from negative infinity, the first number that I'm going to use is a 0. Then I'll pick up from 0, go to 2, and then from 2 to infinity. Keep in mind, this is exactly what we talked about earlier. The numbers I'm using are 0 and 2. Divides my number line into three segments. These are the three segments of my number line. We're going to look at the second derivative here. Okay? So, like we did with the first derivative, we're going to pick a test number in here, and we're going to determine the sign. I'm going to suggest we look at this factored form right here. That's usually the easiest place. So in this interval, we can choose negative 1. So 12 times negative 1 would be negative. Negative 1 minus 2 would be negative. The product of two negatives is positive. Okay? Now, in this interval, we can use the test number 1. 12 times 1 is a positive number. 1 minus 2 is negative. A positive times a negative is negative. And finally, in this third one, we can use the test number 3. 12 times 3 is positive, 3 minus 2 is positive, so the product of two positives is positive. So remember, what the second derivative is telling me, if you go back, let me see again if I can put this on the screen for you. If the second derivative is positive, we're concave up, okay? So here and here, I know that I am concave up. Now, I'm going to abbreviate that CU, concave up. If my second derivative is negative, we're concave down. I'm going to use a CD, concave down for that. Okay, so concave up means we're cupping upward like this. Concave downward, down like this. Now, we still can't really graph this unless we know something about the increasing, decreasing stuff, which I will look at with you here in just a second. But Let's notice this. My curve is changing from concave up to concave down as it goes through the x value of 0. So I have what we call an inflection point at x equal 
zero. Now I'm going to get the y value that goes with it here in a second. Notice again, concave down to concave up, I change at the x value of 2. So I also have an inflection at the x value of 2. Now recall again, if I want the y value that goes with this, y is f of x. So if x is 0, I get 10. And if x is 2, let's see, 2 to the 4th, that's 16. That's 8 times 4, that's a minus 32 plus 10. That's negative 16 plus 10 is a negative 6. So at 2, negative 6, I have another inflection. Now, remember, you can increase concave up or you can decrease concave up. So I don't know on this interval unless I go back to my first derivative and look at that to be able to determine if I'm increasing or decreasing, okay? Now, um, I do want to show you if I, I think we can do a little bit of factoring here on this first derivative. We can factor out a 4x squared, which leaves what, an x minus 3? Okay, critical numbers then would be 0 and 3, wouldn't it? Okay, x equals 0 would make this 0, 3 would make it 0. If I look at intervals like from negative infinity to 0, 0 to 3, and 3 to infinity, and I look at my first derivative, I can tell where I'm increasing or decreasing. We're going to look at this thing right here, first derivative. So let's say negative 1. That would be a positive. Negative 1 minus 3 is negative. So I'd get a negative. I'm decreasing. Okay. Between 0 and 3, I can use the test number, let's say, 2. That's positive. 2 minus 3 is negative. Positive times a negative. Negative. Decreasing. 3 to infinity, let's use a 4. Positive. Positive. So I'm increasing. Okay. Notice that I changed from decreasing to increasing at 3, so I have a relative minimum at x equal 3, decreasing to increasing. Now, that number, the y value, you'd have to calculate. You'd have to put your 3 in here, okay? If you've got a calculator, we might can do that right quick. I don't think we'd want to do that uh, in our heads. Let's see, 3 to the 4th minus 4 times 3 cubed plus 10, I'm getting like a negative 17, okay? Now, we don't have a big enough piece of graph paper to really show that whole thing, but let's do a couple of things here, putting some things together and just kind of show you where we'll eventually be going with all of this. I have a relative minimum down here. Here's x equal 3 at 3, negative 17 down here somewhere, okay? I have an inflection at 0, 10. Not right there. And I have an inflection at 2, negative 6. Right there. Okay? Notice my curve decreases until I get to this x value of 3. Okay, so right here is my low point. But notice I'm concave up till I get to this x value 0. In other words, as I decrease, I'm concave up like this, curving this way. I'm concave downward between these x values of 0 and 2. So as I come from this point to this point, I'm curving down, concave downward this way. So it's concave up, then I'm concave down, okay? Notice then, at this point, I start being concave up but I keep decreasing, so I'm going to concave up again to here. And then as I increase, I'm concave up. So you get the idea you're coming along concave up. You switch to concave down a while. Then you switch back to concave up and then turn and come back concave up. You need to understand that concavity is a different concept than increasing or decreasing. Now, we're not going to go through all this on every one of these problems. We'll do that in another lesson that we refer to as graphing summary. But I wanted you to get the idea of kind of where this is going. Determine the intervals where the graph of the function is concave up or down. 
So since we're interested in where we're concave up or down, we're going to go to the second derivative. So again, we'll need to go through, oops, I'm thinking second derivative, so I was right, and we're going to go through the first derivative. This is going to be f prime. Okay, we'll have 5 thirds x. If I subtract 1 from that, I get 2 thirds. And then minus 10 thirds, multiplying 2 thirds times 5. And if I subtract 1 from that, I get a negative 1 third. Okay, so there's my first derivative. Okay, second derivative. Well, let's see, 2 thirds times 5 thirds, that would be 10 ninths. And if I subtract 1 from that, I get a negative 1 third. Negative 1 third times negative 10 thirds is a positive 10 ninths. And if I subtract 1 from that, I get a negative 4 thirds. Now, taking the derivative here is not difficult, but I wanted to do this example because some students have a hard time finding those values of x that make this either 0 or undefined. So we want to work a little bit on our algebra here to do that. Now, we're going to do some factoring here. The thing that makes this a little bit more difficult than the normal factoring is because our exponents are negative. But I want to remind you that when you factor, you always factor out the smallest power of x, don't you? In other words, if you had 5x cubed minus 5x squared, you would factor out 5x squared, wouldn't you? 5 is a common factor in the smallest power of x. And you would get an x minus 1. Now, keep in mind how you find this. Why is this x? Well, there's two ways to look at it. You had a power of 3. You took out a power of 2, which left a power of 1. Or 2 plus 1 gives you 3. Okay? Now, we're doing the same thing here. You're just having to think about it a little bit harder because of these negatives. First of all, you need to look at these. Which is smaller, negative 1 third or negative 4 thirds? Well, negative 4 thirds is to the left, so it's smaller. So we're going to factor out x to the negative 4 thirds, as well as the 10 ninths. Now, the 10 ninths came out. This is a different power than this, so there's got to be x's left here. Now, how do we do that? You take the old exponent of negative 1 third, subtract the one you're taking out. Remember, when you subtract a negative, it goes to plus a positive. So you're going to get 3 thirds, or 1. Another way to look at this is negative 4 thirds plus 1 gives you negative 1 third, that old exponent. Okay, so at any rate, that's an x to the first power. We took out 10 ninths, we took out x to the negative 4 thirds, so there's got to be a 1 left because 1 times that gives me that. Remember, when you get through factoring, if you're unsure, multiply it back out using your distributive property and make sure that you have the correct answer. Now, since this power is negative and we now have it as a factor, we're going to slide it underneath. So we're going to write this as 10 times the x plus 1 on top. And down here on the bottom, we already had the 9, and that's going to slide under there with it and become a positive power. Okay? Now, we want to know what makes this equal 0 and what makes it undefined. Okay? Well, obviously, since this ended up down here, x equals 0 makes it undefined, doesn't it? Now, if you have a fraction equals 0, I remind you again, it's got to be the numerator that is equal to 0. So what value of x would make that numerator equal 0? Well, it'd obviously be what? Negative 1. So these are the two numbers that I will use to set up my test intervals, numbers that make my second derivative equal 0 or my second derivative undefined. Okay. I might point out to you that in the original function, these are cube roots. Remember, cube root of x to the fifth power, cube root of x to the second power. Since these are cube roots, this function is continuous everywhere. You can take a cube root of positives or negatives. So there's no problem with discontinuity. Okay, let's set up these test intervals, negative infinity. The first number I'm going to use is negative 1. And then I'll go from negative 1 to my next number of 0 and finally 0 to infinity. Again, I remind you, if you get confused, draw your number line, put your numbers up here that you're going to use uh, to set up your intervals. Recall second derivative is what we want to look at to determine concavity. So we're going to look at it right here where we have it nice and factored. Let's pick a value to the left over here like negative 2. Well, negative 2 plus 1 is negative. 
times that 10, the numerator is negative. Now, if I have a negative number, if I take its cube root, I'll get a negative. But then if I raise it to the fourth power, it will become positive 1. Remember, x to the 4 thirds means the cube root of x raised to the fourth power. So since I'm raising that answer to the fourth power, I'm always going to get a positive answer times that 9. So I have a negative over a positive is negative. Okay. In this next interval, I'm going to use the number negative 1 half. Negative 1 half plus 1 would be positive times that 10 would be a positive. We've already discussed here, even though I'm putting a negative number here and its cube root's negative, because I'm raising it to the fourth power, it'll end up being positive. So positive over a positive is positive. And finally, 0 to infinity, if I pick a 2, everything up here is positive, and everything down here would be positive. So that would also be positive. So my curve is concave down here where my second derivative is negative. It's concave up on these second two intervals where my second derivative is positive. The only place where I change concavity is at x equal negative 1. So I have an inflection at x equal negative 1. And of course, if I want to find the exact point where that inflection occurs, I've got to get the y value that goes with that by going back to here. Again, I remind you, y is f of x. So if I put negative 1 here, negative 1 to the 5 thirds minus 5 times negative 1 to the 2 thirds. The cube root of negative 1 is negative 1. When you raise that to the fifth power, you get a negative 1. Negative 1, cube root is negative 1. When you square it, you get a positive 1. Positive 1 times that negative 5 is a minus 5. So negative 1 minus 5 is a negative 6. So my inflection occurs exactly at the point negative 1, negative 6. Okay? Determine the intervals where the graph of the function is concave up or down. You'll notice here I have a discontinuous function. Notice this denominator. What happens if x is 2? Well, I would get a 0 in the denominator, which is not allowed. So I'm discontinuous at x equal 2. Okay? In fact, 2 makes the denominator 0. But 2 squared minus 3 is not 0. The numerator is not 0 when x is 2. So that tells me that's a vertical asymptote at x equal 2. Okay? All right, now the thing that's going to make this one hard is we've got to get the second derivative to find where we're concave up or down. But we've got to get the first derivative first. And that's going to involve a quotient rule, isn't it? Okay, so let's do our first derivative. Denominator x minus 2. Derivative of the numerator, 2x, minus the numerator, x squared minus 3. The derivative of the denominator, that's a 1, over the denominator squared, x minus 2, quantity squared. Now let's simplify this before we start trying to get a second derivative. Let's distribute here. I'm going to have 2x squared minus 4x. And distributing my negative, I have a minus x squared plus 3. This is over x minus 2 squared. Okay? Well, let's keep simplifying. 2x squared minus x squared gives me 1x squared. So I have x squared minus 4x plus 3 over x minus 2 quantity squared. So there's my first derivative. Okay, well, we're just getting started good. We've got to now get our second derivative. And again, we'll have to use a quotient rule, won't we? So denominator is x minus 2 quantity squared times the derivative of my numerator would be 2x minus 4 minus the numerator, x squared minus 4x plus 3 times the derivative of the denominator. Well, down here, the 2 would come down. I would have x minus 2 to the first power, and the derivative inside is a 1. Don't get lost. 
we've done denominator, derivative of numerator, minus numerator, derivative of denominator. Now we need this over the denominator squared. So if I square something that's squared, I get that to the fourth power. Okay? Students sometimes forget to put it over denominator squared. Don't forget that. Okay, let's see what we can do to simplify here. Well, let's see. Um, notice, I'm going to do a little uh, cleaning up first. I could factor a 2 out of this, and it would leave an x minus 2. Do you see that right there? So I can put that x minus 2 with these and have 2 times x minus 2 cubed. Okay, and let's see, here I've got 2, so let's put the 2 and the x minus 2 in front just to rewrite it a little bit. This is over x minus 2 to the 4th. Okay, now you see that minus sign right there? You've got to let that keep your two terms separated for you. We've got a common factor of x minus 2 to the first power and a 2. So we're going to factor out a 2 and an x minus 2. Okay, so right here, 2 comes out, one of these comes out, which means I have an x minus 2 squared left. Minus. Okay, the 2 came out, the x minus 2 came out, so all that's left is x squared minus 4x plus 3. Your algebra really gets a workout on some of these things. Okay, notice now, because we factored out the x minus 2, now it can cancel with these down here. So we will be doing that, but we're also going to do a little more work on that numerator up there. So I still have this 2. That canceled down here. We're going to, inside here, square this out. x squared minus 4x plus 4. We're going to distribute our negative. Minus x squared plus 4x minus 3. And this is over x minus 2 cubed. Okay, we're getting close. Let's pull that 2 down. x squared minus x squared. Minus 4x plus 4x. 4 minus 3 is a 1. So I just have 2 times 1 over x minus 2 cubed, or simply 2 over x minus 2 cubed. Wow, all that work just to get to there. Now, this is my second derivative right here. So we're looking for values of x that make this equal 0. So can this equal 0? Well, that's a fraction. Can the numerator ever be 0? No, it can't. So there's nothing that makes it equal 0. Is there anything that makes it undefined? Yes, x equal 2 will make it undefined. Recall, if you haven't forgotten, that we were discontinuous at x equal 2. We have a vertical asymptote there. But I want to remind you that when we set up these test, test intervals, we use places where the original function is discontinuous, as well as values of x that make our second derivative either equal 0 or undefined. So as it turns out, this is our only value that we will use to set up test intervals. So we will simply have these two test intervals. We're looking at the sign of our second derivative. We'll use it in this final form right here. Let's see, in this interval we could use a 0, couldn't we? Well, the numerator is positive. 2 is positive. 0 minus 2, that's a negative number that's going to be cubed, so it would be negative. So we're negative here. Concave down. In this interval we could use a 3. Well, the 2 is still positive. 3 minus 2 is positive, so if you cube that, you get a positive. So you're positive here and you're concave up. Now, is there an inflection? Be careful here. We changed from concave down to concave up, so does that mean there's an inflection at 2? No. Keep in mind what was going on at x equal 2. You've always got to keep in mind what's going on. We're discontinuous. There's no graph at x equal 2. There's a vertical asymptote. In fact, sometimes I like to make that clear. There's a vertical asymptote right there, so it can't be an inflection. There are no inflection points. But we do change concavity. Basically what this is saying 
at x equal 2, you've got a vertical asymptote. On this side, you're concave downward. And on this side, you're concave upward. So you're probably doing something like this on this side. Okay? Something like this on this side. Okay, this just is going straight to asking for the points of inflection, but to find the points of inflection, we need to know where we're concave up or down or whatever. Notice this function is continuous everywhere since it's a polynomial. So let's get our first derivative. That's negative 6x squared plus 12x, okay, and then our second derivative is negative 12x plus 12. Let's factor that. Let's factor out a negative 12. So negative 12 times x minus 1. Okay? Now, what numbers will we use for test intervals? Well, there's no discontinuities. What will make this equal 0? Well, x equal 1 would, wouldn't it? Is there anything that makes it undefined? No. So this is my only value that I'll use to set up test intervals. So from negative infinity to 1 and 1 to infinity, we're going to look at our second derivative and determine its sign. Let's pick a test number here. We can use a 0, can't we, in this interval? 0 minus 1 is negative. Negative 12 times a negative would be positive, so we're concave up. Okay? 1 to infinity, we can use a 3 here. 3 minus 1 is positive times negative 12 makes a negative. Here we're concave down, okay? We change from concave up to concave down. Our function's continuous, so we do have an inflection at x equals zero, I'm sorry, x equal one, that's where we changed. If you go back to the original function and put in x equal one to get your y value, you'd have a negative two plus a six minus three, that's gonna give you what? A 1. So this point of inflection is at the point 1, 1. Now one word of caution that I want to give you on this example is one reason I wanted to do it. When I took this and factored it, this is the derivative right here. Here's a mistake that a lot of students make. They look at this and they say, well I don't care about that negative, so they rewrite it like this, which is true, I can multiply both sides by negative 1. This will still give you the correct number to use for your interval, but you can't look at this or you will miss the sign of your second derivative. You have to have this second derivative exactly like it appeared, negative 12x plus 12. This is not negative 12x plus 12. So don't look at that to determine the sign on your second derivative or you'll get messed up for sure. Determine the points of inflection. Our function is f of x equals x to the two-thirds times five-halves minus x. Now, I think what I'm going to do is to multiply this out because it'll be easier to take the derivative rather than using the product rule here. So let's rewrite our original function. Five-halves times x to the two-thirds and then minus x to the one. So remember when you're multiplying you add exponents, 1 plus 2 thirds would give us x to the 5 thirds there, wouldn't it? Okay? Alright, so our first derivative, 2 thirds times 5 halves, the 2's would cancel, I would have 5 thirds x, if I subtract 1 from that I get negative 1 third, and then minus the 5 thirds would come down. And if I subtract one from that, I have two thirds. Okay. Now let's need the second derivative. Okay, so negative one third times five thirds is a negative five ninths. And if I subtract one from that exponent, I get negative four thirds. And two thirds coming down multiplying this, I'll get negative ten ninths. And if I subtract one from that, I get negative one third. Okay, 
Now, let's see about doing some factoring here. Since these are both negative, let's factor out negative. I can take out 5 ninths. And my smallest power of x is x to the negative 4 thirds. We're going to practice that again. So negative 5 ninths came out. x to the negative 4 thirds came out. So that leaves a 1 there. 1 times this gives me this. Since the negative is coming out, that will change to a plus, And I'll have to have a 2 here. 2 times that is the negative 10 ninths. What power of x do we have? Is it 1? 1 and negative 4 thirds added together gives you negative 1 third. Okay? Alright. Then we're going to rewrite this. The negative 5 times the 1 plus 2x will stay on top. The 9 is already down there. We're going to move that down with it. Change it to a positive power. X to the 4 thirds. Okay? Now, these are cube roots. They're defined everywhere. So we're continuous everywhere. Here's my derivative right here. Will anything make it undefined? Yes. X equals zero will make it undefined, won't it? So we'll need to use that as a number for, to set up our intervals. What will make it equal zero? Now remember, we don't need the denominator for that part. So negative 5 times 1 plus 2x, what will make that equal 0? Well, it'll be if 1 plus 2x equals 0, right? So I would have 2x equals negative 1, so x would be negative 1 half. So the two numbers that I'll use to set up my test intervals are 0 and negative 1 half. So let's see, from negative infinity, the first number is negative 1 half from negative one-half to zero, and finally from zero to infinity, okay? Again, remember, you're looking at the second derivative right here. Okay, let's pick something in this interval. Let's just say we use negative one, okay? That would be a negative two plus one would be a negative times a negative would give me a positive numerator. And the cube root of the negative would be negative, but I'd be raising it to the fourth power, so I'll change to positive. So I have a positive over a positive, so we're positive here, concave up. Let's see, between negative one-half and zero, I can use negative one-fourth. Two times negative one-fourth is negative one-half. Plus one gives me a positive times this negative is a negative. We've already discussed this. The cube root would be negative, but to the fourth power would make it positive. So we're going to get a negative here, negative divided by positive, concave down. Finally, if we use, say, a 2 in this interval, 4 plus 1, that's a 5. That's a positive times a negative is a negative. And the denominator would be positive again. So again, it's negative, concave down. Okay? So the only place we change concavity is at negative one-half. So I'm going to say up here I have an inflection at x equal negative one-half. Now, to get the y value is going to be a little bit of work here, isn't it? I would suggest that maybe you just take a negative 0.5 and go to your calculator and approximate the y value that would go with that. Determine the points of inflection. This is going to be a quick, easy one, but I wanted you to see something here. First derivative is 4x cubed. Second derivative is 12x squared. Notice the original function is continuous everywhere, x to the 4. So what about this thing? What will make it equal 0? Well, obviously, x equals 0 does. Does anything make it undefined? No, that's defined everywhere. So the only value we use to set up test intervals is zero. And we're going to look at our second derivative. Well, do you see what's going to happen? 12x squared is what? Always positive, isn't it? If you put a negative one in there, since you're squaring, you're going to get a positive. Here, if you put a number in, you're going to get a positive. This thing is always concave up. So there are no inflections, even though 
we had a place where the second derivative is negative. There are no inflections. I don't know if you recall the shape of the graph on this thing. It's kind of a flat bottom thing goes up like that, but it's always concave up. There are no inflections. We have a theorem which is called the second derivative test. Let f be a function such that the first derivative is equal zero at c and the second derivative of f exists on an open interval containing c. If the second derivative at c is greater than zero, meaning positive, then f of c is a relative minimum. If the second derivative at c is less than zero, negative, then f of c is a relative maximum. If the second derivative at c is zero, then the test fails. Let me show you a little bit about what this uh, little test is talking about. Let's go back and notice f is a function where f prime at c is equal zero. If f prime of c equals zero, it's telling you slope is zero at x equals c. So you have a horizontal tangent line there. In other words, you've got a graph. I'm going to kind of sketch in something like this. Here's a place where you've got a horizontal tangent line. Okay? Here's another place where you've got a horizontal tangent line. The first derivative equals zero says you've got a place where you have a horizontal tangent line. Now, if the second derivative exists, if the second derivative is positive, what does that tell you about your graph, your concave up? If you have a horizontal tangent line where you're concave up, notice that that has to be a low point on your graph, so you have a relative minimum. If the second derivative is negative, you're what? Concave down. Notice here, horizontal tangent, concave down, that's a high point so it's a maximum. Now if your second derivative is equal to zero, you don't know whether you're concave up or down, so you cannot determine whether you have a minimum or a maximum. I just want to emphasize that you had a whole lesson on looking at functions and determining where they're increasing and decreasing, and based on where they change from increasing to decreasing, uh, you'd have a maximum. If they change from decreasing to increasing, you'd have a minimum. This is just giving you an alternative way of determining whether you have a minimum or a maximum without having to set up those test intervals and look at increasing or decreasing. That is, it's an alternative way as long as the second derivative isn't equal to zero at the place. Let's uh, see how we can use that second. Okay, well let's see if we can use that second derivative then. Since this is to the uh, fourth power right here, we're going to use the product rule to get our derivative. First function, x. Okay, the derivative of the second one, we're going to pull that 4 down. x minus 5 will be to the third power, and the derivative inside is 1. Plus the second function, x minus 5 to the fourth times the derivative of the first is a 1. Let's clean it up a little bit. This is 4x times x minus 5 cubed, and we don't need the 1 times the x minus 5 to the 4th. Now your plus sign is separating your terms, so we can factor out x minus 5 cubed. And let's see, that will leave us a 4x in the first term, plus an x minus 5 in the second. So x minus 5 cubed, and let's see, 4x plus x would give us a 5x minus 5, okay? Now, you could factor the 5 out. I think I'm just going to leave it there, but at this point, we can see critical values. What is going to make this equal 0? Well, obviously, x equal 5 would, and from this term, x equal 1. So I have two critical values here. I want to remind you that these critical values are places where my first derivative is equal to zero. So what is that telling me? 
I have horizontal tangent lines here. Okay? So that was an important part of that second derivative test. Now, we're going to go ahead and find our second derivative here. So again, the product rule. Our first function, x minus 5 cubed. The derivative of the second function would just be a 5, wouldn't it? Plus the second function, 5x minus 5, times the derivative of the first one, 3 would come down. x minus 5 would now be the second power times 1. Okay, well, let's see. I'm going to write this as 5 times x minus 5 cubed. I'm going to factor a 5 out of this and put it with that 3 and make it 15. And since I took the 5 out, that will be an x minus 1. And this will be x minus 5 squared. Okay, so we can factor out a 5 and x minus 5 squared. So I'll have an x minus 5 here. Plus, since 5 came out, I have a 3 times, that makes 15, times the x minus 1. And we're almost there. Let's see, x plus 3x gives me a 4x minus 5, and this would be a minus 3. Do you see what I'm doing here? I'm kind of doing that mentally. That's a 3x minus 3 here when you distribute. So minus 5 minus 3 is a minus 8. I think I'm going to go ahead and take the 4 out of here and put it with the 5 and make 20 x minus 5 squared, and since I took the 4 out, I have an x minus 2. Now, according to the second derivative test, what I want to do is take these critical values and substitute them down here. Now, notice if x is 5, my second derivative, what happens? Well, if I take 5 and put it down here, 20 times 5 minus 5 squared, well, that's going to give me a 0, isn't it? Second derivative equals zero. Oh goodness, my test fails. I'll come back and talk about that in a second, what we're going to do. But let's notice if x equals 1, which is my second critical value, 20, 1 minus 5 is negative 4, squared would be a positive 16, 1 minus 2 is negative, so I'd have positive, positive, negative. So I'm going to get a negative answer for my second derivative. So, I have a horizontal tangent line. My second derivative is negative, tell me it's concave down. So that has to be a what? A maximum. Tangent line horizontal, if you're concave down, then that had to be a maximum. So I have a max, I guess I should say relative max, at x equal 1. Okay? Now, my test, my second derivative test failed for this x equal 5. So what you have to do there is go back and look at your intervals. So from 1 to 5 and 5 to infinity is what we want to look at. But we have to go back to the first derivative, not the second derivative. I don't care about concave up and down because you can change from concave down to up and not go through a max or a min. I'm looking for increasing, decreasing here. So let's pick 4. 4 minus 5 is a negative. Cubed is negative. 20, because if x is 4, that's a 20 minus 5 is a positive, so negative and a positive gives me a negative. I'm decreasing, okay? And then if we use x equals 6, 6 minus 5, that's positive cubed. 30 minus 5 is positive. Everything's positive, so I'm increasing. So what happened? I went from decreasing to increasing. So it turns out there's a relative minimum at x equals 5, okay? Now, I'm sure you're probably saying, wouldn't it have been easier just to do those intervals in the first place and not have to take that second derivative? Well, in this case, probably so. But I wanted to use this example to illustrate that sometimes that second derivative test works, sometimes it doesn't work. And you have to go back to the first derivative. Don't forget to go back to the first derivative. There are some instances where finding the second derivative is really, really easy, and it's a real quick, easy check for a maximum or a minimum quicker than doing the intervals. There's other instances where it's a lot more trouble to get the second derivative than it is just to set up your intervals for the first derivative and look at increasing, decreasing there. That second derivative test is just another alternative, as I mentioned. There's other ways of determining, but sometimes it is a convenient way. This concludes our lesson.